Hey everyone, thanks for coming to our talk. Uh, my name is Pete Bilter. I'm a software engineer on the Cockroach Cloud team at Cockroach Labs. And my name is Josh Imhoff. I'm an SRE at Cockroach Labs. All right, this talk is called What We've Learned by Building a Multi-Region Database as a Service on Kubernetes. All right, so here's the outline. Um, first, I'm just going to talk, uh, talk about what do I mean by a managed service? What do I mean by a managed database service? And what's kind of required for any managed service? And then I'm going to give a little bit of a background on CockroachDB and what are the unique challenges in running CockroachDB as opposed to some other database or some other piece of software that you might want to offer as a managed service? And then I'll talk about sort of how we got our managed service offering to alpha. We sort of had a uh, setup based on sort of bare VMs orchestrated with Terraform. And I'll talk about the shortcomings of that setup. And then I'll talk about um, how we evolved that into a self-service setup using Kubernetes. And Josh is going to tell some stories about the details of the challenges we encountered there and how we overcame them. And then Josh is going to talk about what we learned along the way and sort of where we're going in the future. OK, so what do I mean by a managed database service? Um, this is a screenshot of it. It just went into beta. You can, you can try it out. Um, that's the end of the vendor pitch. But <laughs> so it's just a UI that, that you can uh, you can go to. It's you know dead simple. You choose which cloud provider you want to use. You choose which region you want the database to be deployed in. Um, we actually haven't fully exposed the multi-region capabilities yet because um, there's some complexity there for the customer in understanding how they want to distribute their workload across multiple regions. But we'll have that by GA. And you put in your credit card, and you click a button, and you get a cluster. So for us, Kubernetes is actually an implementation detail. Um, but this is kind of the story of how we ended up using it as opposed to something else. OK, so let's break this down a little bit. If you're going to offer a managed service, what are the, sort of the core needs that you have? Um, a customer needs to be able to come in, and you need to be able to create a deployment of your software. You need to be able to scale it. You need to be able to recover from faults. You need to be able to perform upgrades of the underlying software. And you need to network the moving pieces of it together. And you need to be able to network outside of your service to the customer's services. OK, so a little bit of background about CockroachDB. Um, what is CockroachDB, and why does it present unique challenges to running on Kubernetes or in general? OK, so CockroachDB is a distributed SQL database. So it um, replicates data. It executes queries across multiple nodes. Um, it has transactions. And it's, it's actually Postgres compatible. So what this means is that you can pretty much write your app against CockroachDB as if it's a good old Postgres or MySQL database. But you sort of have all these magical powers which come from distribution. So your data is replicated. If one of your nodes goes down, the cluster keeps going. And you have a lot more compute because every node is doing compute as well as storage. And it's also open source and written in Go. OK, so what does a typical deployment of CockroachDB look like? This is sort of the simplest possible deployment, one region, three nodes. So we usually just run one, we run one CockroachDB process on each machine. And all of the machines are connected to each other. They form a cluster together. So um, that allows them to replicate data to each other and allows them to work on query processing together. So if there's some data that's spread across the nodes, and you do a certain type of query, or you do a, a certain query, it'll actually figure out that it needs to run that query in parallel across all the nodes where the data is living. It sort of pushes the compute to the storage. OK, but how do client applications access this? Um, you put, like since all the nodes are, are clustered together, you can just put a load balancer in front of all of them. And a client, like your application server, just connects to the load balancer. And through the load balancer, it connects to one of the nodes. It doesn't really matter which, which one. And it sends queries. And if a query goes to a node that doesn't have the data, that node forwards it to the node that does have the data. So that's sort of the, the basics of the networking and storage. 
but it gets more complicated because CockroachDB is actually designed to run across multiple regions. So let's say we have US East, US West, and South America. So the idea is that we want to support global applications. So you want to deploy your data and your application servers close to where your users are. So you can run uh, three cockroach nodes, or however many you want, in each region. And the application servers in each region are going to connect to the load balancer for each region. Um, but the cool thing about this is that the regions are connected so that all these nodes are actually still part of, of one logical cockroach cluster. So you can, your, your tables can be split up where the data in that table for US West is in US West and respectively for US East and South America. But if you want to select star from that table and get all the rows back or count all of them, you can still do that. And it still looks to you as, as if it's one big logical database. <coughs> but it's actually more complicated than this because again, Actually, all of these nodes are connected to each other. <laughs> it took me a while to draw all these lines in on the plane coming here. Um, so all the nodes are connected to each other. And if one of these network links goes down between nodes due to some kind of misconfiguration, the database will actually keep going. Uh, that's why we call it CockroachDB. It's, it's hard to kill. Um, but things will start to degrade in weird ways. So you can kind of already see that networking is complex here, and networking is, is a concern that we want to make sure to get right. OK, so, um, so that's CockroachDB. So what's the story of us offering CockroachDB as a service? So going back to the architecture, we, um, for the first few years of our company's existence, we didn't have a managed service, and there's no managed CockroachDB on Amazon or Google or anything. So we had pretty extensive documentation for our customers saying, hey, this is how you run Cockroach. But sometimes, you know, they got it wrong. And sometimes they spent a lot of time getting to the point where everything was hooked up correctly, even though we tried to make it as simple and as well documented as we could. Um, so we really wanted to offer sort of a one-click experience to get the benefits of Cockroach. So the simplest way to do that, um, at the time, our team a year ago really didn't know a lot about Kubernetes. So we said, hey, you know, we'll just come up with a reproducible way of spinning up bare VMs. We'll spin up, you know, in this case, nine VMs in three regions. We'll have these load balancers. Uh, we'll connect everything to each other. And the easiest uh, way for us to achieve those goals of creating, scaling, recovering, and upgrading was just writing a Terraform file. So just write this file that specifies the VMs and the load balancers and have a couple scripts along with that that install Cockroach on the VMs. <coughs> and that was, uh, that was a manual process for us. Like someone would ask for a cluster through our salespeople. We would basically copy and paste this Terraform template and, and spin it up. So how is this doing with respect to all these operations? Well, it's pretty good at, at creating a cluster. Um, when it comes to scaling a cluster, you know, Terraform didn't really understand the needs of Cockroach that well. It can create a new VM, but we have to run the script to start Cockroach on that VM. We had some very basic failure recovery just through something like supervisor D on each host. But if the host goes down, we didn't really have a good way of recovering. Um, doing a rolling upgrade, similarly, Terraform isn't really something that's built to understand that. So, um, but networking on the plus side was actually pretty simple. You know, each VM just has its own IP, and it actually had its own DNS as well, and we could just point all of them at each other. It's pretty simple. But the real thing that made us look at Kubernetes was that we knew that this needed to be a self-service offering. So um, going back to the screen at the beginning, our designer had designed this beautiful UI where someone can come in, click these buttons, get a cluster. And were we going to sort of build this on top of Terraform? Were we going to build some API that would, that would like, you know, print out a Terraform file and uh, shell out to Terraform? That seemed very, very brittle. So sort of going back to our matrix, to do a real self-service managed service, we need to be able to use this all via an API. We need to have a web console that can call an API that says, make me new cluster. And 
that's not really what Terraform is designed for. So that's really when we started looking at Kubernetes. And Josh is going to explain what happened next. Sorry, I just have to move the mic over because there's only one. OK. Hello. So now we're going to talk about Kubernetes. Um, OK, so we came, the reason that we were interested in Kubernetes was because of the powerful like, automation primitives that it provides. And we believed that like, those automation primitives would lead to a reliable database as a service. So we'll first start with like, those requirements and how Kubernetes does with those requirements. So rolling updates. Everyone here knows Kubernetes can do a rolling update. Let's not dwell on it. Uh, but it's very easy. Um, and you know, it works with a stateful set, which is important for us because we're running a stateful, um, we're running a stateful application. Uh, and, and this is the kind of thing we really like about Kubernetes, how easy this is to do and how much we don't have to build this kind of thing ourselves. What about scaling? So in a lot of cases, scaling would be just as easy as the rolling update command. You would just run this single kubectl command. But this points to some kind of specific ways that we're using Kubernetes that are perhaps unusual. So most, we run one Kubernetes cluster uh, like a, we run dedicated Kubernetes clusters for each of our database as a service customers. Uh, and our database as a service customers, they tell us exactly how much CPU and storage they want like, available in their database. And so this means that we provision the Kubernetes clusters to exactly match what our like, users request of us. This means that to do like, a scale up, we have to do two things. We have to first actually go scale the like, instances. Um, via, well, what we do is via direct API calls to the cloud provider. And then we have to go do the kubectl scale operation, which will actually use the, the new resources. Um, this is easy with Kubernetes, but it's a little bit more complicated. Also, right now we're supporting GCP and AWS, and we'd like to support more clouds. So anything, that's, anything that you have to do directly to the cloud provider is not desirable because it adds like, differences between clouds. What's interesting, though, is that the complexity of the above, though it's not very significant, it actually has led to like, bugs that have affected the reliability of our automation stack. So what we noticed is that occasionally, occasionally a Cockroach DB pod wouldn't schedule. And we go look, and we noticed that there was a VM that did have available resources that we would hope that the pod would schedule on. And we also noticed that there was a persistent volume uh, that, that wasn't attached to any uh, VM that wasn't claimed. Um, but the VM and the persistent volume were in different zones. So there was a, we actually hit this bug two times. The first time I was super relaxed about it. The second time I was like, ah! Um, <laughs> the first time the field, we just did this at this field, which is called wait for first consumer, which tells uh, the, the provisioner of persistent volumes to wait to per, to provision a volume until the scheduler decides on what VM to run a pod. So, you know, arguably a bit odd that you have to think about setting this field, but that's the, the situation right now. So we set it. Uh, then we hit the bug again two weeks later. And, and this one, it goes back to what we were talking about with scaling. So um, it was actually a race condition. Well, what we could see is you can look at the persistent volume and you can see um, for what node the persistent volume was intended. And it would be intended for a node that no longer existed. And what was happening is we would, we would do the scale operation, scale the managed instance groups to the exact right level. Um, and then right after, we'd create our stateful set. Um, and so the, state, the stateful set, one of the pods would schedule on a VM that actually had been removed. Uh, it's just that there's a time lag between when you update the managed instance groups and when Kubernetes updates its list of nodes. Now, normally that wouldn't be a problem because the scheduler would just keep trying to schedule over and over again the way the scheduler does, uh, and eventually it would schedule it because the list of nodes would update. But when you're dealing with a stateful set, it's not like that because the persistent volume was spun up and it's not going to be deleted or moved because that's like sketchy. So uh, yeah, so this kind of points to some of the complexities that we've had that kind of have to do more specifically with how we use Kubernetes and the kind of unusual ways we use Kubernetes. But overall, Kubernetes is doing a good job. We, we're looking at it because the automation stack is solid and provides a good foundation for us, <laughs> and it's like delivering there. We're going to give scale a yellow, 
but everything else green, and especially we're going to give the use via API green. Like this is a the fact that Kubernetes provides APIs makes it really easy to like build a service on top of it. The big question mark for us is the network, though. Pete was kind of getting at this before. So the reliability of the automation stack, that's important, but what's much, much, much more important is that the database as a service works. Like the database as a service must serve queries. And the database as a service, in order for it to serve queries, the network has to work. We can survive like small losses of network connectivity, but if the network fully doesn't work, then obviously our database doesn't work. So let's talk more about that. So there's kind of two parts to this. One is the, um, just the general complexity of the Kubernetes networking that you take on as a Kubernetes user no matter what. And then the other part is a part that's very specific to us, which is this, the complexity of doing multi-region networking in the way that we require as a, because of CockroachDB's requirements. So first, just basic Kubernetes networking. You know, one of the core promises is that you can run lots of workloads on a single VM, lots of pods on a single VM. And in order to not require that application developers have to worry about ports conflicting, each pod gets its own IP address, uh, which means that a node has a bunch of IP addresses routing to it. Um, but there are other IP spaces. There's the pod IP space. There's IP addresses for the nodes themselves. There's also IP addresses for services, which have to do with internal load balancing. Now, this is a good abstraction. Most of the time as a user of Kubernetes, you don't have to exactly worry about this. But if our database as a service breaks and the cause has to do with these things, we have to keep them in mind as on-call engineers. And so this is complexity that we're taking on that we previously didn't have. But the really, the technical meat of building our database as a service on top of uh, Kubernetes really has to do with this multi-region case. So again, CockroachDB, it can run across uh, regions. And you might do this for availability reasons, so you can survive the loss of a region. You might do it for latency reasons. Kubernetes is designed to be run in a specific region only. If you spin up a GKE cluster, you choose a cloud region to spin it up in. This means the problem is, how do we run CockroachDB? Um, how do we run a single CockroachDB clusters on multiple Kubernetes clusters, one per region, while still maintaining our requirements? Uh, mainly that there's full node-to-node -node connectivity. That is, every node can address every other node by some stable network identity. Kubernetes doesn't really provide an out-of-the-box solution to this problem. <laughs> and there's different ways that we could do it. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the way that like, we've chosen for a database as a service. So first, like, what does Kubernetes provide? Well, if you use a stateful set, you can get a stable network identity. Um, in the form of DNS names. And by stable network identity, what I mean is that uh, the network identity is associated with a specific persistent volume, even through pod restarts. But the, the Kubernetes DNS service, it's only accessible from within the Kubernetes cluster you're in. So if you're in a single region situation, Kubernetes provides what we need, stable DNS names. But if you're in a multi-region situation, it does it because the DNS names aren't accessible externally. The solution is that we're going to use a service of type load balancer to expose the Kubernetes DNS services externally. So the service of type load balancer will spin up a network load balancer like in the public cloud uh, that exposes the Kubernetes DNS service. And then we're going to configure the Kubernetes DNS to proxy DNS lookup requests for nodes in other regions to these external load balancers, which we've spun up. So uh, here's an updated diagram. Uh, we still have, uh, we have three regions. We have SQL load balancers for our users, but we also see the DNS service in green, with the Kubernetes DNS service, and uh, the DNS LB, which is the external network load balancer that we've spun up via a service of type load balancer. So uh, if you want to do, if you want to look up the, if you want to do a lookup for a node in another region, say uh, this node in US West, you want to go look up uh, a node's DNS name. You want to do a DNS lookup for a node in US East. What you're going to do is the DNS lookup is first going to go to the, the normal DNS service in that region. That has configuration that tells it to go proxy it over to that network load balancer. It will hit the DNS service in region uh, US East, and then it will come back. Then you have a pod IP, 
the pod IP is routable throughout the whole VPC uh, on GKE by default on EKS when you do some nonsense that I don't even want to talk about. <laughs> and then you're good. So uh, how are we doing? So the network, we're going to give a yellow. It's certainly more complicated than the network that we started with. And, uh, but we, we think that the kind of like benefits of the automation stack and how like solid it is outweigh the complexity costs involved uh, with a network. So to, to kind of like wrap up, we just want to talk a little bit about different reasons you might use Kubernetes, why we're using it, and like kind of how, how we fit into that story of, of different use cases. So Kubernetes is like a very broad service. There's lots of different reasons you might use it. Uh, a very common reason would be that you want this like bin packing ability where you run lots of different workloads on like big, big VMs. Maybe you, have a, maybe you have like a bunch of different microservices made by a bunch of different developer teams and you want to have this big pool of compute managed by a central infrastructure SRE team. You want this like standard production platform and Kubernetes gets you that. That's like not our use case at all. Uh, we're not running a bunch of different microservices um, and we're running a Kubernetes cluster per customer that's exactly provisioned to, the, to what the customer wants. So we're just using it to get access to automation primitives, which we do not want to build ourselves and we think are very solid. But what's interesting is that we've kind of learned over time that there are benefits that we didn't think about so much that are, are really important. So this is like a KC, a kubectl get all um, output for a cockroach cloud cluster today. What you see is you see, um, you see a bunch of different stuff running and this isn't the whole list. There's other things that, I'm, that are in a different namespace that I'm not showing. Um, but some stuff we knew we'd run, so like backupper and cockroachdb dash zero, backupper takes backups, cockroachdb dash zero, um, that's the actual database. We knew we'd have to run those things, but we, we didn't know we'd have to run other things. So the HA proxy is providing Grafana for SREs, the SQL prober is doing black box testing of the database itself. You know, the point is just that um, our, our production requirements are evolving over time, and the, the like, <laughs> flexibility and solidness of Kubernetes as a platform kind of lets us evolve the production stack over time. And that's a really big benefit that wasn't really top of mind when we like, made the choice. We were really focused on solving a narrow problem, which is good automation for a self-service product. Uh, so that's that. Oh. So OK, so um, evolve would give a green for Kubernetes. So that's our talk. Any questions? Um, yeah? I have, I have two unrelated questions. So can we do one and do somebody else and do the other one? Sounds good. The, um, so the first one is one of the teams I work with is Signal Thick Cluster. And I think they would be super interested to hear your feedback on what you developed and what your needs were and that sort of thing. Like we recently did a survey, and I was just checking, and you guys didn't fill it in. OK. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Your use case is interesting. Um, gotcha. So I'd like you to connect there if you can. That sounds um, great. For that matter, I also want to specifically introduce you to the submariner folks who are grappling with the how do we spread our network across multiple clusters. Great. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Well, I mean, that wasn't really a question, so maybe if you want to yeah. give your answer. <laughs> so uh, my question is, is something completely different, which is, um, I, um, for really large clusters, how are you handling trying to funnel down the network interconnects <coughs> between those? Repeat the question. Yeah, so the question is, if a cluster gets really big, does the the full network connectivity that we require like scale? Is is that is that a good summary of the well, question? I, I mean, honestly, I know it's not going to scale. Well, so not infinitely. Yeah, right? yeah. And so, what most sharded databases do at some point is they figure out a way to funnel it down. Right. Um, and I was wondering if you've done that yet, and if so, what it looked like. Um. So we're both on the, the, the team that focuses on the managed service, not the actual core database. So it's not a, thing, not a place where, we're, where our knowledge is super strong. Um, so I don't have a great answer to your question. Uh, although we've run like very large deployments um, 
before. So I, I, I think there's probably like something smart going on that I just don't know about, but I can't really give more detail than that. Yeah, I would just add that practically speaking, I just don't think it's something we've run into yet. I think the biggest um, clusters we've run are on the order of like 100 nodes, 200 nodes. And it yeah. seems like the IP space is, has been big enough or with the setup thus far. Yeah. Well, particularly what I'm thinking about is if those nodes are in different regions mm -hmm. and you say have two copies of each shard, <coughs> doing the replication streams for each of the shard copies between the regions is doubling your network interconnect cost, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so the minute you go to multi-region, the interconnect problem becomes a problem a lot faster. Right. Um, because you're paying for every bit you send back and forth. There's also the, so a lot of times when people run in a multi-region, um, in, in our multi-region cases, a lot of times what's happening is data is actually staying within a region, but it is replicated within the region across availability zones. So you're not getting a lot of okay, so like traffic across regions. I mean, you could do that, and there are times when we do that, but that's not necessarily the super common production setup. Tim? Um, it's not clear when you're crossing regions, are you doing it intentionally, like I want to talk to East, or are you doing it saying, I want to <coughs> iterate over the totality of sort of this equivalence? Does that make sense? Uh, so w when, you, when, when you're connecting to a specific node, whether regardless of whether it's in your region or a different region, the reason you're doing that is because you've done some lookup that says that the data that you care about is one of the copies of the data you care about is stored in that node. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so you mentioned Kubernetes doesn't have a built-in way to connect multiple <laughs> clusters. Um, they did have Federation V1, which was dropped, mm -hmm. and never went into GA, and now Federation V2 exists. I don't know where it is in terms of that sec, but if and when it does become GA, would you consider getting rid of your DNS load balancing and the sort of custom stuff to incorporate Kubernetes cluster federation? Yeah, so the question is, um, there, there have been some, some uh, Kubernetes things in the past, such as Federation and, and now Federation v2, and those might help us solve these uh, multi-region networking problems that we currently have our kind of like uh, <coughs> DNS chaining custom solution for. And the question is whether we would consider moving to those more like common uh, offerings. Um, and we definitely would, yeah. Uh, I think we're, we're doing something custom because we feel that, that that's the best option for us right now, not because we, we like want to. I think we don't want to. <laughs> yes? Um, other than the networking issue and the PV, AZ affinity, what's been your, um, you talked about the advantages of moving to Kubernetes, but what's been your biggest pain point? Um, okay. There, the, yeah, sorry. So the question was, um, what what has been another like, what has been your biggest pain point moving to Kubernetes other than the ones we mentioned that have to do with instance group scaling or networking? Um, we've just hit a, a variety of different edges that are kind of along the lines of the, the ones we've already mentioned, um, and I don't think any are like super significant. Like the multi-region networking one is certainly the most significant. Um, another one we hit had to do with. We provide firewalling, like the, the cluster is available over the public internet, but there are firewalls obviously. Um, and we tried to implement this a variety of different ways. Um, and we had to implement it a different way on GKE than we did on EKS. GKE supports this load balancer source range field, which what, is what we're using. EKS does not, well it supports it, and then when you use it, doesn't work at all and it's like, it adds you, you mutate a, a firewall entry and it just adds it, and you're like, oh my god. Um, so I think, I think like, there's just been a lot of edges like that. That's, I think we're pretty much out of time. Right. All right, thank you, everyone. Woo!